Representing the United States of America, Phil Williams. Oh, you've had a chance to see Phil several times. Yes, I've worked with Phil a bit in the coaching. And he's very, very good. He's very impressive. Has an awesome back. One of the best backs you'll ever see anywhere. Has his own style. All right, guys, Sean Ray here for Digital Muscle, and where are they now? I'm joined by the 1985 NPC overall USA champion, and, oh, I take that back, 84 USA champion, and 1985 NPC national champion, and I could have sworn you won a show in Chicago. Chicago Pro, 1988. Look at me, 1988, uh, the Chicago Pro champion, Phil Williams, uh, here in Venice Beach, California, Actually, we're in Marina Del Rey, where I kind of spent my time down here back in the late 80s. Uh, and right after I actually met you, Phil, let's start at the beginning, okay? So, mm -hmm. you're originally from Missouri. Right. Let me uh, get a little ahead of that. Yeah. Now, my Phil Williams is my adopted name. Okay. And a lot of people don't know this, and I've always wanted to talk about it, but it's never really come up. So, I was actually born in Egypt. Wow. I was adopted in America. Are you Egyptian? I'm Egyptian. Okay. A lot of people don't know that. I, I'm learning. Yeah. So uh, I was born in Egypt at two months old. My father was supposedly a diplomat or worked for the government. My parents, biological parents, came over and something happened with my mom. This was the story that I was told by my adopted mother. Okay. We don't know what happened. She didn't make it or didn't do well. I was put up for adoption. So I was adopted in America by my uh, biological parents, not my biological parents, adopted but my parents. adopted parents. Right. And uh, so my mom who adopted me was from France. She escaped Hitler's invasion of France in 1940. Wow. Okay. And worked her way over to the US. My father was a professional boxer in the 30s and the 40s. Okay. He fought on the same card twice with Sugar Ray Robinson. American the, fighter? American fighter, okay. yes. Didn't do that well back then, hard to get ahead. So he ended up working full time during his boxing career and then retiring. How old were you when you knew you were adopted? About five. Okay. Um, did that affect anything? I mean, you find out at five you're adopted. Do you know what that is? Well, I didn't know what it was. It had to be explained to me. And of course, the kids in the neighborhood knew I was adopted and that's where the bullying started. Okay. So were your parents black or were they white? Okay. My mother's French. Okay. She's white. Now she's got a Moorish ancestry. Okay. So she's not true white okay. but she's french and she's jewish okay my father was black so there's a lot going on in this family were you the only one i was the only I, there was a second sister she was adopted okay uh she died later on of aids actually at what age at about 25 okay and so is she older she was younger two years younger um and that that's got to change a person too i imagine i mean yeah. she was your sister exactly um how do you wind up in the gym Okay, the bullying led to that. Okay. We got about 10 years of bullying, paying 50 cents a day, protection fees. Of course, my father, which was a professional boxer, taught me how to box. We used to box in the backyard, but with bullies, it's three or four of them. So you're outnumbered. Right. If I could catch them by myself, I could get away with beating them up, but then I'd payback would come, and then three or four would get me later on. Where, where's the origin of the bullying coming from? Uh being probably unusual being different they couldn't figure out if you're white black that or yeah, whatever yeah, of course the most question i've ever been asked is what are you yeah so i went through life with that mm -hmm. and then being adopted that was another reason for bullying the fact that i was a loner was another reason for bullying being bullied so i i mean i can imagine you got a lot of self-defense mechanisms going on being bullied uh were there certain individuals oh absolutely one of the main bullies ended up murdering three people. Holy crap. Yeah, this is how bad he was. Yeah. And he's in prison to this day. Um, what year are we talking? Your birthday is when? Uh, I turned 62 this year in June, June 3rd, actually. So some perspectives, you're right there with Lee Labrada and, and Lee Haney. All about the same age. Yeah. yeah. Um, and somewhere along the way, uh, I imagine these lessons, they landed you in a gym and you thought, what, I'm going to get stronger? I'm going to well, be able to... I'm gonna I'm going to get away from this bullying shit. I'm going to end it. Okay. Okay. So I met a guy I went to school with 
when I was probably in seventh or eighth grade. I was 14 at the time. Mm -hmm. And he showed me pictures of his father. We had a show and tell. His father was a bodybuilder, one of the best in the state. His father competed against, uh, I think it was, uh, boy, who did he compete? Boyer Cole and Harold Poole. Okay. So old school guy. Yeah, yeah, real old school guy, guy. And he didn't want to help me at first. He goes, ah, Philip, you don't want to work out. I said, oh, David, help me. David, help me. I bugged this guy for six months. Okay. Finally met him at the downtown YMCA in Kansas City. There's no gyms back then, of course. No bodybuilding gyms exist. Okay. And he started me there. How old were you? 15. 15, okay. That's about right. I mean, a lot of guys yeah. start in the teenager, which you rarely hear these days. You rarely hear about a teenage bodybuilder that goes on, but it seems like historically looking back, the good ones had a good teenage run. I mean, Lee Very Haney good. was a teen national champion. Sure. Uh, I know that uh, Chris Cormier and Flex Wheeler started both as teenagers teenage. coming I remember up. Them as teenagers coming up. I think Branch Warren and Jay Cutler, both teenage sure. national champions. So you got started as a teenager. When did you realize you were actually bodybuilder? When I was 17, I competed in my first show. It was a Mr. Missouri Valley. It was a novice show. Mm -hmm. So I take, took 13th in that show out of 26. Wow. And wow. then six months later, I went to the Mr. Missouri. Like I said, there's no teenage division in the state of Missouri. And I took second in my class in the Mr. Missouri at 17. That had to give you confidence. That did. Yeah. And so who were you looking at? Like, I want to be like this guy. Who were the guys? Samir Banut and Robbie Robinson. So they were on top. And this, what year are we looking at? We're looking at 78, 76. Okay. Oh, 76. I started 76 all the way through 1980. Yeah, so take yourself back to 1976. When I think of 76, I'm thinking of like... Uh, well, Franco Colombo won the Olympia in 76. In 76, right. Uh, you know, uh, Lou Ferrigno was coming on the scene. The whole movie Pumping Iron was being made. Right. Um, what else was going on in the world in 76 that, that you can remember? Wow. Uh, I mean, this 76. is right before the Iran-Contra thing, right? Wasn't it like uh, 77 when that 77 happened? 77 when that happened, yeah. yeah. 76, I, you know, he, he, he gave me, David, the guy that trained me, a stack of old magazines. So I went through those magazines every day and found out who was who who was this who was that mr this mr that yeah who had all the titles who the title holders were wasn't that, wasn't that fun yeah to do all, that that's all i did yeah <laughs> and it, it, it's amazing because that story resonates to a person samir Banu told me just the other day that's what he did him and his brother were going to watch a movie with this actor van cleef he had i think he had a quarter or, or 20 cents or something and it was either go to see the movie with his brother or buy this magazine that Arnold was on the cover of. He bought the magazine. Yeah. And from cover to cover, and it just sucked him into the sport of bodybuilding. And, and your story is very similar. Very to similar. That. Yeah, very similar. So when did you realize, like, you know what? I'm on to something. I want to go to the next level. What was what was the next level? Well, after the Mr. Missouri, I went to the 78 Teenage Mr. America, which was held at the Shrine Auditorium. Do you remember who in was LA? in that? Yeah. Rudy Hermosillo won. Okay. I don't, okay. I don't recall that name. Wow. He was... Uh, Sponsored by Gold's Gym. Gold's Gym put on the show. He was sponsored by Gold. Deserving winner. The heavyweight or the tall. There, I'm, let's get away from weights. We're talking about height classes yeah. in the AAU. AAU. So he won the medium. I ended up taking 13th in the medium class again. And a guy named Ken Cole, who was trained by Chet Yorton, won the tall class. And the short class winner... No, the short class winner was actually Rudy Hermosillo. Okay. And a guy from Michigan, Keith Bogoff, who was representative of a powerhouse gym back then won the medium and so now you're in this show and w when do you realize like you know what i want to be mr olympia like when does that even come into your economy it already had it had it already See, had. was planted so yeah. now you you set out to do what become mr usa well not really I and mean, i was going to work my way up the ladder i wanted to be teenage mr america while i had the opportunity to so i went back again in 79 now there was a teenage mr coastal usa in may put on by doc neely out of atlanta yeah and i beat lee haney in that show he ended up taking fourth and i ended up winning that's got to give you some confidence not to know lee didn't have a name at the time yeah none of us did we right. were all unknowns kids that came from different areas to right. in that show so we're talking about may june july august september october in detroit michigan 79 teenage mr america yeah lee haney comes in it doesn't look like the same kid I <laughs> against five Atlanta, months later five months later wow and yeah. he won the show how and funny I is taking fifth in the medium class so part of what i like about the where are they now is the stories they they intersect a lot with people that i interview um my first teenage nationals was in detroit oh okay. and that's where i met bob chicarillo and dave lieberman and some of the other cats 
in the Teenage National Championship. So this is 1979 yeah, for they you. They were also in the show for you. Yeah, yeah I, I was there in 1984, so I came sometime behind you. But but Detroit, Powerhouse Jim, right. the Dabish Brothers, the Dabish. Samir was out there. Yes. So you were right in the thick of it, and Lee Haney wins the show. Where do you wind up? I ended up fifth in the medium high class behind Doug Brignol. A lot of people may know him. Mm -hmm. uh, second was a guy from a gym in New York, uh, Steve Mihalik's gym, yeah. Andy Lopadoti. Okay. Okay, third was, no, Doug Brignol didn't win, Frank Pantoja. Frank Pantoja, oh, he is a Roy Lillemeyer disciple, yes, yes. and ultimately won the California 1984 that I won the teenage category. So okay. that's what I'm talking about, these intersections of yeah, uh, history. Yeah. So Frank won. Yeah, Frank Pantoja. The medium. Uh, second was the guy Andy Lopadoti. Third was Joe Fulco. And fourth was a guy named Joe Fulco, who was already Teenage Mr. USA. That so these year. are all names you got to Google to find out what they yeah. look like. Um, well, let's fast forward. At some point, you had to become a front runner for like a national title or were you a front runner no uh my next show after that was the 1980 mr coastal usa i went back to atlanta to go to the open as a teenager yeah i won it of course i turned 20 next month in june and the J july held the 80 teenage mr america so i was already 20 years old so okay. i couldn't go so now you're an open competitor I'm an open competitor, okay. but I didn't compete in an open show. I met my girlfriend out here, which became my first wife, mm -hmm. a Swedish girl, and I moved to Sweden with her. Okay. And ended up winning two years later the 1983 Open European Championships, where a week later the guy that won the heavyweight class won the overall Mr. Europe. And this is the year for me, which is pivotal. That's when I started bodybuilding. Of course, I didn't know who you were. But I knew who John Brown was because he introduced me to the sport. Right. So now I'm on the scene. I'm kind of paying attention. I don't know who you are. 1983, you're still trying to find your bearings. What's next? Okay, after the uh, 83 Open European Championships, I was able to get a lot of guest posings throughout Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Germany. Okay. So I rode that out for a while, and then I planned to come back to the U.S. in 84 for the Mr. USA. Now, the USA now we're starting to find out who you are. So... 1984, the USA's was Vegas? It was San Jose. San Jose, Paul Love promoted that show, exactly, right? Exactly, okay. yes. So how did it go? Uh, going into the show, I was hoping to get in the top three or even top five. Did you know the guys who were coming up here? No one. Okay. I knew Neil Spruce, I knew he was, I knew he had placed well, and he was one of the front runners coming into the show. I'd never heard of Gary Stridham, mm. and I'd never yeah, heard South of a lot of the other guys in there. Yeah. They were unknown to me, because I was in Europe at the time. Right, right. The last two years. But they were there in the contest. Yes. Because I know Gary Stridham had issues with this South African residency right. coming to America, and he would ultimately become a 1986 NPC overall champion, but you'd beat him to the punch, so you would come in to San Jose and win the USA title. Right. Um, do you know, you were light heavyweight. I was a light heavyweight. 195? 194. 194. Uh, and that did not turn you professional. No. Oh, no. There no. was no pro card. That's, we'll get into that later. The pro card thing was crazy. Yeah. So you win the national USA championships. And was it a full year before you showed back up on the scene again? It was a full year. Actually, before the USA, one week I won the amateur Grand Prix, which was held at Santa Monica High, Santa Monica High School. Now, that quali qualified me for the USA a week later. Okay. So I won the overall in that. And then after the USA, I moved back to Sweden and started training for the 85 Nationals. And that would take place in 1985 where? Miami, Florida. Okay, so this is when I, I come on the scene because I won the Teen National Championships in 1985. And in the summer uh, of 1985, you and I both, we met yeah. at a Wally Boyko event here in Anaheim. Right. About 45 minutes south. Uh, I was the guest poser. You were a guest poser. John Brown, Kay Baxter, Mike the Zipper Zabel and Marlon Darton. I remember like it was yesterday. Yeah. I'm a teenager on this dang thing. And here you are, Phil, uh, guest posing. And, and you were telling me in the car a little earlier, we were kind of serend serendipitously thrown together. Uh, they didn't have a hotel room for you that right. night. Right. And I, like a fanboy, just invited you to come stay at my house. Correct. With my dad and my brother. And uh, I would pay attention very closely to what you would do after that. Because this is, I believe, like June or July of 85. Right. Your national championships were coming up, I think, either September or October. 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 And you went on not only to win the light heavyweight, but the overall and your pro card. 
No. Or not yet. No pro card. You had to win the U.S. Universe. Right. Holy crap. So when you won the Nationals and the USA's, you still were not a pro. No pro. You were the best amateur in America. No pro card. So they said, go, where did you go? The World Championships was held in my one of my hometown cities in Sweden, Gothenburg. Wow, went to your backyard, that's right. I think they held the Olympia there that year, no? Uh, 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 year prior. Uh, year afterwards. 86, right? Yeah, 80, 86 or 87, okay. I believe it was. Now, uh, I went there exhausted and depleted after winning the Nationals, traveling back and forth. Right. Uh, competed against Joseph Gromulus. Romulus, I guess. Who had beat, Rich Gaspari had beat the year prior. Right. In Vegas. Mm -hmm. So I end up, funny story there, I won't get into detail on all that. A lot of the Swedish judges were friends of mine. They were test judging. Right. At the universe. They kind of told me what had happened. They said, well, they put you down lower than they should have. And he goes, you won't be able to catch up. So I already knew I'd lost going into the night show. Wow. That's got to be kind of daunting. That's yeah. Well, it, yeah, it, it was, uh, Nothing I could do about it. I just went in and just posed my ass off and did the best I could do. Okay. You know, and the posing went well. I mean, everything went well. Of course, ended up second place. No pro card. Wow. So, US, you won the USA overall. Right. Nationals overall. Correct. Universe second. Right. Where's the pro card? That, no pro card. What happened? Didn't get one. Only the winners receive a pro card. So we're in 1985. So who won? I know Lila Brada won his pro he card won in 85. Ron Love? No, Ron Love. Ron, Lo Ron Love took third. Wow, okay. And I guess he later on petitioned, and they said, well, I don't have a pro card. They said, well, you have to, you know, contact Jim Mannion and petition for one. Okay. I didn't think I deserved it. Because you've been beaten by Joseph. Because I got beat. Right. Right. So I said, well, I'm never going to have a pro card. So what did you do next? This is, where, this is where you lost me because I could have sworn you you turned pro when you won the universe. No. Okay, no, so you no were second card. in the universe. Two years later, in '87, I finally, you know, petition. got what it took to petition for a pro card. Okay. And I got one in '87. Yes. Okay. So 1987. Of course, I'm not paying attention. JJ Marsh uh, and Laura Caval, I believe, win the mixed pairs at the USA's. Right. He gets his pro card that way. Mike Quinn wins the USA's in 1987. Gets he gets card. his pro card. I win the Nationals in 1987. In my mind, I'm thinking, you're already a pro. Mind you, Gary Stratton wins the 86 National Championships. Right. Um, pro and card. A pro card, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so here we are, 1987. You get your pro card. And what happens next? Well, I got ready for a show. I went back to St. Louis, Missouri. There was a guy named George Turner who owned some gyms, a slew of gyms in St. Louis. Yes. One of the best in the Midwest. I started training with him when I was about 17, 18 years old, and I worked for him. Crazy story, I, things I did just, I used to leave high school, right, on a Friday afternoon from Kansas City. I'd get on the highway, drive 400 miles to St. Louis, wow. train Friday night, sleep in my car, wake up Saturday morning, train, look for something to eat in the Kroger store, train Saturday night, right, go to sleep in my car again, train Sunday morning. From there, I drive back to Kansas City, 400 plus miles. Yeah, you don't find that kind of dedication today. <laughs> and they ask us, why do why do guys look so good in the past? It's because of this type of yeah. dedication uh, just to get get to where you want to go. So he had the best gyms, one of the best gyms in the country at that time. Let me ask you something. 1987, you're doing all these things. You petition, you get your pro card. Did you see me coming? I won the oh, national championship. Yeah, absolutely. Because we had, we had we'd kind of gone our separate sure. ways. Absolutely. And I, I didn't no. see where you went. Oh, I remember that. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Because you wound up in Sweden, and my brother married a Swedish girl. Right. And they moved to Sweden in 1988. Yeah. And you said you ran into him there. Yeah. I'll tell you a funny story there, real quick. He came back to my apartment one night, and I said, let me see what you look like. And he ended up stripping down, and my jaw dropped, man. Yeah. He had some genetics, my brother. Oh, <laughs> uh, and he only been training for a couple of years, seriously, mm -hmm. and he trained with his brother-in-law. Right, Thomas. Who, who didn't look like the average guy walking down the street. Right. And they trained together. And your brother was amazing genetics. I think my he, jaw just dropped. He got third, I think, at these Swedish championships. Oh, I'm not surprised. He jumped in and got third. <laughs> I'm not surprised. It wasn't, it wasn't in the cards. He had kids, and he, he kind of did some other things. But from 1987, you, what Olympia was that you went into? Okay, I didn't go to Olympia. Right. I never I never never made it there. Okay. Now 1988, I 
got ready in 87 i got ready for the night of the champions right due to the relationship with george turner who was a madman he was known for being crazy a lot of tr guys like steve mahalik and some others yeah you just <laughs> couldn't be around this guy he wanted to work you to death he yeah. was always bugging you I, I just didn't have the mindset to deal with him okay. so i ended up leaving there we ended up falling out and so from there, I went to Miami, Florida and started training there. I actually trained in Sun Gym. Sun Gym, famous. Yes. Uh, what is it? No pain, no, no gain? No pain, yes. Sun Gym, look that up. On, on John the... Carl Meese and I John became Carl good Meese. friends. Right. So I used to train at John Carl Meese's gym and I went to a few other gyms, you know, just for change or, or, or variety. Right. But I trained there for the show and then I trained, went, left there. He allowed me to stay in his gym for the last two weeks. So I didn't want to pay rent for the new month. Right. That I wouldn't be there. So I slept in the locker room. Wow. That's at dedication. night on a massage table. Yeah. And people were thinking it was glamorous. Oh, this is what oh. bodybuilders did <laughs> in order to compete. They would sleep in the right. gym. They would drive 400 miles. I mean, the dedication was sick. What were you eating? Oh, basically back then, just chicken, uh, tuna out of a can, uh, rice. Counting calories at all? Oh, it's not really. I had a guideline or an idea yeah i never did count but i never really counted okay no i never i never, never took it that far yeah people are counting macros and calories no, and all these things and they didn't get caught up with all these numbers didn't no never got caught up into that okay. never had to mm -hmm. the system i had from the time i started competing as a teenager i kind of kept and put it together and it continued to work so i stayed with it but you also had to see myself coming up in the ranks Absolutely. and some of the other guys were coming up and somewhere along the line you decided i'm going to get back on stage so you took a couple of years off right competing yeah. But you never stop bodybuilding. Never stop training. Right. right. Train continuously. And trained so you, as hard as ever. You wound up in Chicago. Was that 88? That was 88 against Gary Stridham again. Right. So here's the familiar face, Gary Stridham. Sure. Gary had a big name back then. He's one of the few big guys that name. could stand shoulder to shoulder with Lee Haney. Right. We knew he had the weak back problem, but we had those big, big yep. delts, Deltoids. those big quads, yep. square quads and big caps. Pecs. And 88 was supposed to be his year. Yep. Um, and... He showed up at the Olympia and got fifth place. Yeah. He died it down too much. I heard he lost like 100 pounds well, for that show. He, it's 254 in Chicago. Three weeks later, he went down to 222. For the Olympia. For the Olympia. And disappeared. In three weeks. But you and beat bang. him in Chicago. Right. Correct. So you took out the bigger man in Chicago after basically a two or three year layoff. And he went to the 1988 Olympia. That was my first Olympia here in Los Angeles. Why weren't you there? Ah, the reason I made a mistake. Okay, I took out Dactone. Which is a diuretic. Right. And I took potassium along with it. I made a terrible mistake of doing that. So I couldn't move. I was so weak, I couldn't get out of bed. Wait, wait. When When is this? Is this the night quick? before the Chicago Pro? Okay, yeah. So Jerry Branham came to my room and brought me some sodium chloride and pulled me out of it. So I was lucky enough to make the show. I don't remember the show. Wow. I mean, I do not remember anything about the show. So just to be clear... These aldactone and potassium, these are things that can kill you. Yes. Uh, we know Mohammed bin Aziza and Correct. some other athletes have actually died from diuretic Correct. abuse. Uh, Paul Dillette was carried off the Arnold Classic stage. stage in 1994 due to diuretics. So here you are in this, is it a catatonic state because you don't remember it? I don't remember. I don't remember the show at all. I remember Jerry coming to my room and helping me out. And staying with me until I was fully enough to after recover, the show was over. Before the show, okay. This is before, but I, for some reason, I don't remember the show. And yet you won. I won the show. I don't. That's remember crazy the show. because that's like your first pro win. <laughs> I don't remember your first pro show. You don't even remember I the damn thing. I don't remember any of it. So how, what brought you back to normal? Was it hydration? It, um, it had to have been. Yeah. Whatever he did to me, the things that he gave me pulled me out of it enough to get on stage win the show but like i said i have no memory of the show itself do you think you were on the brink of death i think i was damn near there wow. i was on death's doorstep so did that scare you away from bodybuilding uh, yes it did and it left me to the point where two weeks after the show i hadn't fully recovered so there's no way i could have Got know. ready for it and gone into the Olympia three weeks after that Chicago. Did pro. you tell this story before? Because people just I've got never told this story. Yeah, people wondered like you won Chicago. I saw that, and I thought, "Where's Phil? You were nowhere to be yeah, found." I was, I was out of it, man. That was 1988. 1988. And so, was that your last show? It wasn't. We'll go on. Uh, I'll tell you something. I, I always want to tell this story too, and it has a lot to do with the focus I have. I have tremendous focus, but I'll tell you why I haven't. 
if you look at let's imagine this is a giant umbrella mm -hmm. right and that's called an autism right so i'm right here i have autism okay now when I, mom took me to see psychiatrists and find out what my peculiarities when i was a child growing up they said oh he'll grow out of it uh don't worry about it it's it's nothing serious but but it was autism and that word i didn't know i didn't it know didn't what exist. autism meant yeah they didn't have it that word didn't exist it's like covid then. people had covid they didn't know it until sure right so but that gave me the ability to focus i mean like a laser like focus right 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 and whereas others people would fall off fall, exactly so you're high functioning autistic yes i have two nephews that are uh, autistic and i know uh, Victor Martinez has a couple of kids that are autistic and it's a big spectrum the movie The it Rain Man huge if spectrum. you don't know anything about autism watch the movie Rain yeah. Man there's high functioning and then there's non-functioning pretty much pretty much exactly. it, is, it is a scale but uh, in dealing with that uh, it's what a bodybuilder needs that focus a bodybuilder that needs focus that I had. you have that advantage now, but you also had some genetics that were your calves I yeah. mean your, yeah. your tiny oh, little waist I mean, the bicep peaks. sure great genetics yeah. i mean i didn't know i had that going into bodybuilding of course who knows what you have until right. you get in there and do it but later on people tell me your genetics and i'm thinking okay okay i'm not really sure what that means but okay mm -hmm. you know i, I didn't know but yeah, yeah i think the genetically gifted athletes realize as well like you can't take it away but you can't take the hard work away that you still have to put in you still have to put in. genetics will get you so far oh, like rory lelemeyer yeah. and matt mendenhall sure but sure. at the end of the day you got to do the work you got to do the work so when you recognize that you had autism, was this while you were bodybuilding or after you were bodybuilding? It came a little bit after uh -huh. because the people around me, I have certain things that I do and there's certain things that I've learned to control. Like I don't like crowds. Yeah, like, it's a very quirky type thing. Yeah, I, I don't like crowds. I don't like going in a place, a crowded gym I won't go into. Mm -hmm. if the, I won't go to a stadium. Even though I've worked and done security in stadiums, it, it was a job. I focused on the job, right? not the people. I get it. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, you're, you, they call you the Enigma, yeah, and now that, I know that, why. That's where I got the name. That's, <laughs> okay. And then I rock constantly. I'm never still. Yeah. I mean, I rock all the time. I don't even know I'm doing it. My wife noticed it, and she goes, well, you, how come you rock so much? I mm -hmm. said, do I? I'm thinking, well, I know I do. Yeah, well, you I mean, I, I remember in Rain Man, the movie, right? That's what I do. Uh, Dustin Hoffman. I do it all the time. I do it in my sleep. Okay. Uh, is it something that's curable or controllable it's i guess you're conscious of it i'm conscious of it i've never really tried to control it yeah i mean not really i mean i did my mom tried to control it okay and she couldn't there, it, 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 nothing worked so let's fast forward man i mean mm -hmm. if chicago wasn't your last show what happened after that after chicago of course oh, let's talk about money yeah okay the money to participate in bodybuilding not cheap. It was slowly coming into the, the business in the early in, 90s. But I mean, my first meet with Joe Weider, I'll explain this to you. This is funny. I've never told this story. I've told it a few times. Yeah. I go see him after I win the USA. And I'm thinking, well, maybe I'll get a contract, you know, mm -hmm. see what happens. It wasn't really a thing yet, getting contracts it, not in really. Not really. It wasn't. But I was told that it's, it's a possibility lies there. And so I went to see him and he goes, well, I can't give you a contract. He goes, but this is what I can do. Once you get back into shape, I'll pay you $300 for every article that you do. And I said, okay. But you gotta be a writer. Were you? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Article meaning yeah. like- uh, Interview. Interview. Right. That's a interview. And so I went back to Sweden. Of course, kind of just disregarded that. I can't stay here and get into shape again yeah. for an interview. Right. I'm not going to do that. That's going to cost me a lot of money. I'm going to be upside down. Getting ready for every show, primarily you're upside down going into a show. Right. Unless you're sponsored because you've got to spend the money that it takes to get into shape and do what you need to do. Right. So after the Nationals and the World Championships, I went to Joe for the second time and was told the same thing as the first time. After the Chicago Pro, I went back to Joe hoping for maybe I've accomplished a little bit more maybe you know yeah because you won ten thousand dollars yeah well ten thousand dollars re was reduced to five thousand because of poor ticket sales isn't that crazy how that can even happen <laughs> how is that even allowable <laughs> you're absolutely right you got screwed on that and, you, and there's no way to get it back <laughs> there's no way oh no what poor ticket do? sales here's half your check yeah that wow. was it Wayne D'Amelio yeah that was and it we, I'm trust me Wayne D'Amelio <laughs> there's a reason why he's not running things these days but 
All right, so you got hosed on that one. So I went back to Joe again after the Chicago Pro, same thing. $300, an interview or article. And by this time, he is giving out contracts. I, yeah. I know, because I had one. Yeah, so no again. Wow. So I, I've always worked full time while getting ready for every show that I entered because there's no money coming in. Right. Where's money going to come from? Right. So I found jobs working security. Uh, I worked at the Marina Pacific Hotel after the Chicago Pro. I don't wow. know. If, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Remember that? Worked I, from 11 at night till 7 in the morning. I remember the Marina Pacific Gym. I like that one. It's right yeah. over here. Right. But the hotel. Oh, yeah. The hotel the on hotel. the beach on the boardwalk. Yeah. Joe Bucci. Oh, Joe Bucci to... was running that. Exactly. where all the bodybuilders said you were working there. I worked the front desk. Wow. From 11 at night till 7 in the morning. Well, that's why I never saw you. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I never saw you. Okay. So let's go into the... We're going 88. Let's go 90. Guys, the heavyweights coming in are getting bigger and bigger. And the WBF is coming, and also steroid testing is yeah, coming yeah, in 1990. All, so all that came about, and I was looking to get into a show. We went to the 92 Night of the Champions, and I think I took 11th, if I remember correctly. Now, I was trying to get bigger. Night, yeah. uh, Kevin Lavroni. Kevin made his pro debut, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it was then, his pro and debut. And then he went on to get second in the Olympia that year. Uh -huh. Yes. <clears throat> and again, Things didn't work out well. Of course, I wasn't really happy with the placing. Four thousand dollars, I think. No second. money at all. No money for zero. Oh, no, no. Eleventh oh, place. Oh, no okay. money. Oh yeah. No, okay, no yeah, money. I'm sorry. No, no money at all. Okay. I went to the '96 Ironman, wow. which you were in. Do you remember yes, that? I was third. Yeah, it was a ill-fated, last-minute decision to jump in. Yeah, yes. and I got tenth. That. that I show. can't believe I competed against you. And I don't yeah. remember. <laughs> Maybe it was the diuretics. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, so I you were in, in that 10. show. I was happy to take 10. Man, yeah. after, as long as I'd been out and the things that were going on, I found out later on that, oh my, I'm still doing the same program. And things have changed. Performance enhancing drugs yeah, that I did in the 70s in 1980. And everything had changed. Yeah. And I talked to Chad Nichols on yeah. the phone. I said, what would it take for me to catch up with what they're doing? And he told me what they were doing. I said, well, what would that cost? And he told me the cost. It's interesting because Chad has always been adamant that he didn't even get started until 1997 working with people. So I'm glad you put that in perspective because I met him in 96 too. Okay. He denies that he was even busy no, I working with athletes. before the 96 show. It, it was either before or after I spoke with him because I was trying to catch up, consider catching up. Yeah. And at the cost of what all this substances would cost. It wasn't worth it. I, I, I was 30, at 36 years of age. No, I wasn't going to do that. So that, that was 1996. That's crazy. Yeah. So did you get any injuries while you were bodybuilding? I've never been injured in the gym. How, when you walked away, did you know you were walking away or was there? At 96, a... I knew I was walking away. Yeah. Now there was a chance I thought the Mr. Olympia over 40. Yeah, because they did have that since 1994. Right. Uh, and but perspective in 94, mm -hmm. Robbie Robinson right. won. 95 it was Sonny Schmidt I Correct. think 1996 was uh, 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 Claude Gruel I think 96 Claude Gruel won uh, uh, I think Vince Taylor came along after that after that and it was a guy that Chad Nichols had worked with Don uh, Young Youngblood Blood. but he won it in, much later in 2001 was it later? okay yeah, I, yeah my years confused about the years but that show was there and you were contemplating that yes and did it ever work out? no it suddenly vanished yeah, I think it was gone after like 97 or something. Yeah, it, was, it vanished. And Vince Taylor and won so a bunch of them. That threw me out of the whole bodybuilding competitive. Did it, did it, did you lose something? Did you lose any love for bodybuilding? I mean, I've always had a love hate relationship with it in a sense. I love training. I never really liked competing, but that was a way to become known. And I was hoping that that would, you know, go somewhere, lift me, put me in the spotlight, or get me covers on a magazine. That would bring you more work. The more covers you get, the more you're exposed, the more work you get. Right. But that never took place. How did it work on the photography side? Because, see, you can't get the covers unless you're doing the photo shoots. Were you in touch with the photographers? Not with the photographers. Because you were living in Sweden for a while. Was, so that was... Out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, that was. that's what happened. Yeah. I mean, became, everyone's, yeah. everyone's living down here in Venice Beach. And the sure. Photo, uh, the, the photo shoots are taking place in Golds and these other gyms and yeah and if you're not here you're not gonna get you're it gonna, i didn't get it i think vince taylor was saying the same thing he felt yeah. like he never really got his publicity not, yeah but these were not photographers that were going to travel to photograph you not, had to come here you had to come to that and, and you were gone by then sure so that and hurt I didn't that have hurt the money you. to put come aside back no, that definitely not so what do you think of bodybuilding today when you see it does it move you at all you know i'm i'm i'm, I'm I do pay attention. I'm going to say I don't pay attention. I do. I know who the top three and four, six 
guys are top pros in right. the world. But the rest of them, there's so many now that I, I, I can't keep up with it. When you started bodybuilding, you said you read the magazines cover to cover. The sure. magazines are gone. Where do you go to get your fix? Are you looking through Instagram? That's the only way I know. I mean, you can go to YouTube and Instagram, find out show results here and there. And I keep up with it that way. Yeah. But I mean, to be honest with you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of it. You don't go to the shows? I do not. Um, what do you make of Big Rami as Mr. Olympia twice? Well, I mean... Not your cup of tea? Not really my cup of tea. Yeah. I respect the size and what he put, he's put into it, but not really my cup of tea. Yeah. Uh, and what about classic physique? Is that something you pay attention it's to? It's something I started paying attention to recently. Mm -hmm. Just recently. So I know who uh, the guy's name, Preon. Bumstead. Bumstead. Preon. I know Bumstead. Pre what's the other guy? Preon. Preon, yeah. Preon, and I yeah. know, uh, is it Diesel? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Terrence Ruffin. Ter Ter Terrence Ruffin. Yeah, there's a couple, a handful of guys. Yeah, there's but a handful. Is it bodybuilding light? Because I always look at the kind of bodybuilding light. It's, it's bodybuilding like, yeah. in a sense. But I mean, it hasn't really taken off. No, not not for me anyway. Uh, it'd be interesting for me, anyways, to see these bodybuilders combine standing next to some of these classic physique guys. Because I personally believe that Chris Bumstead could take out a lot of bodybuilders oh, in the he, open category. Most like, yeah, sure. I mean, just his overall package is sure. so much more complete. Yeah, very possible. Very uh, possible. So the money never came your way. Did you train people? I've tried training people over the years in different places, different states, different countries. Uh, I'm about to approach that again. Uh, I use a high intensity system that, similar to what Mincer did. Yeah. I added my own twist. But I, I believe in high intensity training, but less volume and frequency. Who, how do people find you if they want to be trained by you? Where do they go? Well, I was on Instagram, but it's been hacked. Yeah, everybody, <laughs> everybody's getting hacked these days. So it's gone. Yeah. I got to start all over wow. again. We all are familiar with but, that. But uh, I have to go back on Instagram again. Yeah. To be honest with you. Yeah. I tell you, I'm doing a podcast now. I like to mention this. I mean, I'm still involved in bodybuilding. I do a podcast with a group of uh, guys in Florida. Okay. Uh, Ian Harrison's involved with it. Uh, J.P. Fuchs, yeah, which he's in Palm Springs. Right. Uh, there's a few other guys, Ryan Potansky and a guy, Jason Naz, who puts puts it on. Together. Okay. Yeah, he's one that directs it and puts it on. And this is this bodybuilding talk 101? This is 101, bodybuilding about health, about training, about diet, about Where do we, where do we find this podcast? It would be, it was originally called Talkin' Fitness, T-A-L-K-I-N Fitness. Okay. And now it's most muscular. So if you, you know, go to YouTube and Type, type in, in most muscular, muscular you'll find us is this a weekly show or we do it usually every thursday night and this is a schedule change all things bodybuilding all things bodybuilding so what would you like to see done in bodybuilding i mean like the money passed you you missed the money ride which inevitably will lead you into retirement or early retirement but what would you like to see in bodybuilding that maybe you don't see today is there anything particular? Would you like to see it back on national television? It would be nice to see it back on national television. Whatever happened to that? Well, the World Wide Web reaches a wider audience, and I just think sure. it's maybe easier to jump through the hoops. Perhaps so. Yeah. I, I remember ESPN was requiring drug testing, and, and then you turn it on, they have darts on the area. Oh, you have sure. hatchet. Yeah. You have hatchet throwing. You have Tid arm wrestling. Yeah, tiddlywinks. Tiddlywinks. <laughs> uh, spelling B. Hopscotch. But, but bodybuilding is not there. <laughs> right. but, so the World Wide Web is where the, is the home to bodybuilding. Yeah. But I mean, it just for me, I always think like if we could just get back on TV, it'd give yeah. a little more validation. That well, would help. I think it would make a big difference. You know, yeah. it, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. There's a few other things that could change to make it better. I don't know what they are. Well, what about all these bodybuilders dying? I'm sure you're aware. Oh, we've done podcasts on that. Mm -hmm. From Sean Roden to Dallas uh, Carver. Uh, McCarver. Where we had read the autopsy reports and it, some of it's crazy man. yeah the, I mean, in terms crazy. of the autopsies on some of these guys it's crazy that they're taking all this stuff well, or they're just not aware of their inner workings i have no idea I mean, because a lot know. of bodybuilders just are not aware of, of what's happening inside yeah and well, they're using the mirror exactly. to validate everything that they're doing in the gym yeah and that's internal internal and external yeah just not and getting they're ignoring the internal they're probably not getting the checkup they need to be that's necessary and with all they're doing, I mean, it, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, but you weren't doing what the guys are doing today, yet you uh, look better than a lot of the guys today. <laughs> so what is your advice to these cats competing? Well, advice would be, you know, I, I don't, I, I've never worked with a coach. Neither I'm I. not into that. No. I'm not into coaches. Uh, it's about- You gotta learn your body. You, you have to learn yourself. Take the time to learn your body. 
what works for you and what doesn't. And I think that's the thing that the guys are willing to take too many steps. They, they want to get from A to Z Fast. in one leap. They want someone to tell them how to do but it and instead then do of, it. Instead of taking A, B, C, stair-stepping it slowly. Yeah, I mean, I would not want to go to a lawyer or a doctor who got their degree online. No, <laughs> you know no, what I mean? no, no Like, you got to put in the, <laughs> you got to do the residency and do all the hard work. Sure. Uh, but you avoiding injuries all these years, uh, what do you chalk that up to? I've never trained that heavy. I train with intensity, but I train moderately heavy. Okay. So let's say with a leg workout, my rep range would go between 15 and 20. With the upper body, any tour between eight and 15. What about now, today, 62 years old? I do, do the same thing. I train each body part three times a month. Okay. So I train the whole body over a 10 day period. Now, when I was in my twenties, I tried to train, not, not twenties, in my teens, I'll go back further. The six day a week thing didn't work for me. Right. I was constantly overtrained and felt like shit. Right? So I started training each body part after going to a Mincer seminar and spending time with him one day a week. Okay. When I got in my thirties every seven to eight days. In my forties every eight to nine days. Now in my sixties every 10 to 11 days well it's amazing because you're counting i mean i'm lucky to get in the gym three days a week <laughs> and when i do there's not a whole lot going on I'm, I'm a professional walker these days as you can tell yeah got a little bit more body fat on but i i exercise right i don't train so i think that when people say how are you not getting hurt I, i'm i revere the heavy weights i revere the injury factor i measure i'm calculated that if i live that i could tear this i could sure. hurt that absolutely so rather than train I exercise, function, functionality. I just try to keep things moving. Um, but you, you look phenomenal. How much are you weighing now? Uh, I weighed about 196 the last Which time I got on It's almost scale. your competition weight. Which was, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw Labrada, and Labrada, 165 pounds dripping wet, but he looks phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, and it's just kind of like taking the mindset of training and, and doing functional Right. Exercise. Uh, I don't run. I walk. Do you run? Or do you I cycle? Walk. Do you swim? I walk five days a week for Same 30 here. minutes. Thank you and me both. Same I walk thing. a little bit longer than that. Yeah. I put my headphones in and I just go. Like, yeah. I'm the rain man when it comes to walking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, boom, I'm gone. Um, yeah. But what else do you about? So you were, you were very mobile. You moved around a lot of yeah. places. I've lived in five countries. Wow. Three marriages, five countries. Kids? No, I, believe no it or kids? not, no. Uh, Egypt, you ever been? Yes. One time. We, did you feel a connection to the hometown? The it motherland? was strange. I mean, yes, yes. But at the same time, I don't know anything about being Egyptian. Right. So it's lost in a sense. Yeah. But I felt, I felt it. The history. Yes. Yeah, I was there. I saw the pyramids and all that stuff. Yes, absolutely. It's definitely one of the seventh wonders in the world absolutely. to see the, the pyramids. Uh, you're 62. We don't know how much longer on this planet either of us have, but what would you like to accomplish between now and then anything on your bucket list to do yeah. travel see friends i don't have any friends where i am all my friends are global they're yeah. all over the place and i think a lot of bodybuilders relate to that yeah so i mean i'd like to travel a little more as soon yeah. as we get set down and all of this is over with with the COVID thing and omicron the delta and, yeah every and and the, the, politics who knows what's war. coming up oh yeah World war three coming up possibly right who knows Times so it, it's hard to plan for anything right now as far as wanting to travel the way I'd like to. Because I imagine when you did travel, it was just eat, sleep, and train. Oh, you didn't really that enjoy was it. it. Yeah. That was it. You didn't, yeah, you were places that you do, well, never dreamed of. Yeah. But yet you were there to train. You were there to do a seminar. You were there to do all these different things. And the time you were the time you was there, it was short. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things that you want to go back and see. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, married. Yes. Uh, how many years? We were married in 2018, so this will be our fourth year. How's that? Fourth anniversary in May. It's with her. It's great. Yeah, in it's a good great. place. It works. Beautiful place. Yeah, and yeah. no complaints. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you want to try to to get done that you might not have already achieved besides just seeing the world in a different way? I know you're sharing your life with a new one. Four years, pretty new. Well, I mean, just stay healthy. Yeah, stay strong. Uh, Keep my mind strong along with my body. It sounds like that would be the advice for these new jacks coming up, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I would say so. If, yeah, if you had healthy. A, if you had a son, 17, 18, 19 year olds wants to bodybuild, yeah. are you behind that? Wow. Uh, yes and no. Again, yes and no. I'd be happy to support, help him with the training. 
Uh, as far as the other side, the dark side, I'd be a little weary of that. Yeah. I try to talk to him and coach him, get him the best people, advise him of what he needs to do, what not to do. I mean, I wouldn't say I'd be completely against it, but I mean, I wouldn't be too excited about it. Yeah, it's, it, it is, uh, there is a chemical element that there's some responsibility that comes oh, along absolutely. with it. absolutely. Great when you're talking about your flesh and blood. Great responsibility. Uh, anything you want to say to your fans on the way out the door here at uh, Digital Muscle, where are they now? Sure, I'm gonna talk about health issues real quick. I had some extensive dental, extensive dental work done. Let's say, not quite two years ago, uh, about two years ago. Right. I ended up with endocarditis, if you know what that is. Okay, it's after having ex extensive dental work, the bacteria travels to the heart. Wow. Right? And I was suddenly feeling exhausted. I mean, just everything I did was exhausted. I just felt depleted. And fatigue. Like, What's going on? Fatigue. Great fatigue. And so I finally went in. I talked to a friend of mine on the phone who's a physician, and I described the symptoms to him and he said you you have any dental work done i said yeah he goes you have endocarditis he goes go now i walked around with this condition for three months before i did anything about it which was when he stupid. said go now where did you go cardiologist i went to the emergency room okay told him what i had they kept me for two weeks wow right on the spot right yeah. on the spot got up recovered from that which i had to open the chest up you know uh, i had a heart murmur which needed to be fixed or worked on and they finally sealed it, and I had three arteries that needed to be cleaned. So it was a seven and a half hour procedure. Wow. So I recovered from that. We're trained for nine months. She and I go home one evening from the gym. My wife's my workout partner, by the way. So I train with her. She trains with me set per set, exercise per exercise. Mm -hmm. And I felt a sudden twinge in my left side. I said, well, that felt weird. What was that, I wonder? We went and watched a movie, and like four hours later, I'm in agony. I can't move. My appendix the burst. Appendix, correct. So you felt it burst? I did. Wow. Yeah. And that could kill you? Yes. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> she called an ambulance. I couldn't sit in the car seat. I remember blacking in and out, being in the ambulance, raising up, looking up, and blacking out again. The next thing I know, uh, they tested me for COVID, which I've had two vaccines and a booster. Did you have COVID? They said I did. Holy crap. They said I had it. And they wow. couldn't do the surgery. Then they called her back an hour later and said, no, it's an emergency surgery. We're going to do it regardless. Wow. And got the surgery. So how long ago was that? Three months ago. So you're still kind of on the mend, a little ginger. Three months ago. Uh, you, you're definitely blessed to, yeah. To, yeah. to survive all of that. Exactly. And so the cleaning out of the arteries is good? Good. Rich Kaspari was telling me he went in for a mild checkup and he said like he was... A, a month away from a, the Widowmaker. Wow. So he recommended yeah. that these bodybuilders, doesn't matter where you're at in no, your career, no, it go and get not just an EKG, yes. but a total scope of the heart just to make sure total everything's Total heart scan, absolutely. So it seems like the older athletes are telling us on their way through their journey of life to the younger athletes, don't wait till you're their age no. to get a checkup. Get the checkup now. Make sure you have your, 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 your documents in order. Get your health insurance. And just for nothing else, just Absolutely. have them check you out. Yeah, that's check, the tech away. We say check yourself before you wreck yourself. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> all right. You well, for the enigma here in uh, the marina of sunny Southern California, uh, Phil Heath, man, pleasure having you. USA national champion, Mr. Universe. He's got it all. Williams. Williams. Who do I call you? Heath. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, getting old. <laughs> it's not the best thing in the world. We only got two Phil's. It's Phil Heath and it's Phil Williams, man. Uh, but the Enigma. Uh, so did you ever find out what your birth name was or no? Uh, no. Never no, did. Never All right. Did. Well, you never are did. Phil Williams. I'm going to go by. Probably can pronounce it. You're the Enigma. Who, let me see. Uh, I think, uh, what was Phil Heath? Phil Heath called himself the, the gift. gift. Yeah. There you uh, go. I think uh, Brandon Curry is the the prodigy. Prodigy. Uh, okay. There's so many cool nicknames out there. Jurassic Paul Pellet. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, anyways, it's been a pleasure. The Black Prince, right? There you go. For Phil Williams, I'm Sean Ray. And where are they now? Here at DigitalMuscle.com.